and I'm the program director for Jewelry, Textiles and Materials at Central St. Martins. And I'm extremely happy, pleased and yeah, delighted to welcome the Collar Hive um, to our second shared online event, which we first piloted last year as a kind of live editorial to showcase some of our students and graduates work from yeah, just after they finished um, their final year. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Hannah Marlein um, to this event, who we'll be introducing in a second. Um, this year, our event focuses on exploring biomateriality. And it's no coincidence that this is also the first year that we have our first MA Biodesign graduates at St. Lisa Martins graduating. We started this course two years ago um, in close collaboration with our Designing with Living Systems Laboratory led by Professor Carol Collet. And over the last two years, um, we have seen a really, really strong interest in exploring biomateriality in our different courses. Um, and our program has four different courses, two BA courses, BA Jewelry Design, BA Textile Design, and two MA courses, MA Material Futures and MA Biodesign. And the beauty of this event is that we're bringing together students, graduates from across the program um, to discuss uh, and showcase the different approaches they have. And you will see that we have very different kind of approaches from craft, very craft focused, working with bio-based materiality to very scientific approaches. And all of those are kind of part of our very vibrant program culture. Let me introduce you to the panelists. We're just waiting for, for a slide to come, but I can maybe introduce, yeah, great, Hannah Marlein, um, who is representing the Collar Hive and also Mix Magazine, a trend and forecasting agency that um, will introduce more about their work in a second, as well as Rebecca Hoyce, who is an associate lecturer at Central St. Martins, but also a, a mixed magazine contributor. We've got our students, Cynthia Ferrari from MA Biodesign, Abigail Goodwin from BA Textile Design, Roni Levy from uh, BA Jewelry Design, Lars Dietrich from Material Futures, and Louis Bundrist from MA Biodesign, and last but not least, Nicole Krisiku from MA Material Futures. I'll hand over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much for, for you know, offering all your valuable time and expertise to selecting these students. Uh, to be honest, we could have selected a number of more projects because we have had so many fantastic um, kind of projects this year. But if anybody wants to have a look on our um, graduate showcase, which is online at the moment, we'll post the link in the chat as well. So you can also vis visit other students' projects as well. But I'll pass on to you, Hannah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for the, for the introduction, Anne. Um, it's a real honor to be part of the showcase again this year. Um, I've so enjoyed the process, where, you know, working with you both. Um, and it's just a chance to dive a bit deeper into the graduate projects, which is um, which is great. And as you said, it was it was really difficult to pick just six, but that sort of the theme of biomateriality really feels right to explore at the moment. Not only with um, the new MA Biodesign course at um, CSM, but it's a big topic of conversation on the table at Color Hive right now. So um, yeah, it was really good to kind of dive in a bit deeper. Um, so just a little bit on us before we before we start. Um, so if you've not heard of us, Colour Hive, we're a London-based creative agency um, and our main focus is on trend and colour forecasting and analysis. We work on everything from product strategy to colour and material design through to content and marketing strategy uh, with clients. So with the very cr uh, proud creators of Mix magazine, uh, this is a quarterly publication for professionals which is now part of um, Color Hive membership, and it's where you'll find our published forecasts. Membership also includes a very detailed CMF forecasts and design impressions, each exploring everything from kind of trend drivers, stages, uh, design concepts, color stories, and of course, inspiring uh, materials and surfaces. So for many of our members, our forecasts are also a path to discovering new designers and, and new products and kind of new ideas. So it can be a really great platform for, for potential collaborations as well. Um, I do believe uh, current CSM students can access membership uh, via the library amongst sort of other e-resources. <clears throat> 
So rather than uh, today focusing on sort of superficial or just kind of aesthetic outcomes, we really want to highlight some projects from across the jewellery, textiles and materials programme who have set about tackling some kind of pretty big issues today. So new designers continue to play uh, a really crucial role in finding solutions to the challenges we're kind of facing today um, in the world. And we really believe innovation and science will be their essential tools. So offering solutions or possible solutions to ongoing consumption issues, the graduates that we've uh, selected to, to share with you today ag address some kind of really core issues. So everything from sort of sustainability, uh, ethical sourcing and environmental protection. Uh, this is through experimental processes and material outcomes, as you'll see. So these bigger picture kind of societal issues um, really have a big impact on our lives, of course. They create shifts in our preferences, our, our buying choices, and they ultimately influence the way we relate to design. So biomaterial kind of explorations or sort of that them taken quite literally play a big part in building the future of sort of design directions, not only for Colour High, but kind of the, the, the bigger world. Um, and I suppose on an, an aesthetic level, it's possibly something not, not that new that we've been talking about, but we're placing a lot more focus on it sort of in reality, um, as these materials and processes become more accessible, they, they, they're starting to come to market, uh, manufacturing capabilities are kind of improving and, um, and happening. And of course, consumer demands are increasing as, as kind of awareness um, increases too. So just one more thing before we dive into uh, the projects, I just wanted to share a few examples kind of design wise and, and what we've been looking at over the last couple of years and sort of what we're looking at right now and how this sort of, um, how this all sort of fits together. So <clears throat> just to cycle back a little bit, back in 2018, we forecast a story uh, we call Clarity, which sort of addressed that desire for kind of pure, aesthetically kind of clean and sort of almost slightly clinical, I suppose, environments. Um, little did we know how quite kind of relevant this would feel um, maybe during last year and um, going on to this year. Um, but here we really looked um, sort of beyond that kind of well-established mix and match aesthetic or that sort of really blended kind of mashed up colour you find or typically find in recycled materials and composites. So kind of looking for sort of a cleaner sort of break, visual break, I suppose here. So as part of this, we highlighted designers exploring everything from pineapple leaves, particles and dust from clothing, and kind of a, a focus on sort of new packaging alternatives across um, our, our forecast, but in quite a kind of refined um, sense. Um, for 21, 22, we looked, uh, so this is another design direction of ours um, called Cloister. So um, again, didn't, <laughs> didn't quite know how relevant that, that would feel. Um, but uh, this is where we really explored a sort of parallel between, I guess, a lo longevity in objects, um, but also designing for a kind of temporal existence, um, especially in terms of materials. So we referenced um, sort of low impact biomaterials and processes. So things like mycelium, we were talking about sort of paper, paper pulp, looking at organic glazes and natural dyes. So these are all things that are kind of starting to sort of bubble, bubble through. Um, and then for 2022, uh, we published um, a story called Custodian. So this was really inspired by those sort of cycles and rhythms of kind of natural, natural systems, I suppose. Um, the idea that we, that we own nothing permanently, we are simply caretakers for kind of the future generation. And that's sort of what this is, this is what all about. Um, we continue themes of biodegradable substrates, so everything from we looked at kind of orange peel, pulp, eucalyptus and beechwood, um, and of course we followed the um, super interesting kind of mycelium um, uh, story and looking at kind of local colour resources as well. Um, then for 22, 23, it's something we're working on at the moment, um, bringing together some really interesting designers working with kelp and sort of shellfish waste um, for our story coast. Um, and then right now, uh, this is all kind of under construction, we're putting together the first publication um, of a story for 2023 called Clinic, uh, where we're really focusing on those developing relationships with designers and scientists, um, 
like like all the graduates here today, they've kind of um, this is very much the the realm that they're working in. So addressing this kind of need to to make these kind of cultural and practical changes to protect uh, the future and our planet, of course. Um, all of these projects that you'll see uh, today, uh, we're we're putting together an extended feature in the next issue of the magazine as well. So watch watch this space. Um, so that brings me really neatly to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, which is uh, Chinchia Ferrari from the first graduating year of the MA Bi Biodesign course. Uh, so Chinchia, over to, over to you. Hi everyone, my name is, uh, is Chinchia and uh, I am a graduate from the Biodesign new Masters. Um, I'm going to take you through my project, Ciano Fabrica which is um, an investigation on the cyanobacteria biomineralization as a novel biofabrication uh, method. And I want to start by introducing uh, my organism, uh, cyanobacteria. They are photosynthetic uh, single cell organisms. They survived all five uh, mass extinctions on Earth and they can be found in almost all habitats. Um, a little bit of background, uh, cyanobacteria biomineralization um, is a metabolic uh, reaction. So the absorption of CO2 during photosynthesis causes changes in the composition of the water surrounding the bacteria, and this results in mineral precipitation. These minerals bond with sea sediments and polymers, forming strong uh, composites. Uh, examples are stromatolites, fossils from 3.5 billion years ago. My project is inspired by research from uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. They demonstrated how to create strong bricks by inoculating uh, cyanobacteria with gelatin and uh, sand. Uh, so I instead decided to focus on a specific output, uh, sunglasses. Uh, the choice combines my interest in uh, transparency and innovative uh, practices against wasteful processes and what's considered good enough. Um, as of today, bioacetate is considered uh, the sustainable option for sunglasses, but even if it comes from a natural um, resource, um, it still involves wasteful processes, toxic components, and it has an end of life that is not that clear. Uh, while cyanobacteria also offer good UV protection thanks to uh, a compound, cytonamine, which is currently being researched for uh, sunscreens. And uh, during the past year, I've been learning how to understand the cyanobacterial growth and processes thanks to supervision of a team of scientists. Their advice was fundamental for me to be able to um, reproduce the uh, Boulder experiments and then to find my own uh, uh, process. Uh, so I expanded that research by working with uh, different cyanobacteria strains to demonstrate how this process can potentially be applied locally and by using an algae derived uh, substrate. Going into the design development, the organism took a fundamental part in my system and contributed to the final aesthetics. Um, the shapes that I designed are inspired by microscopic observations of, um, of the patterns uh, recognized during my uh, observations of the growth. So this is a uh, scene um, that co-created with the cyanobacteria cynicococcus. And uh, despite a uniformity in, in the process, the outcome uh, depends on the materialization coming from a, a living system. And uh, this is uh, noticeable uh, in, the, um, in the pattern of the base that I created. And uh, this base has been made by using a uh, first experiment in order to show how this uh, material can be endlessly remanufactured. Uh, moreover, cyanobacteria pr produce also a pigment, a blue bright pigment called phycocyanin that I used uh, to experiment as a possible paint. And I printed the name of the frame uh, on, uh, on it using this pigment. And uh, thanks to uh, the new microscope that we received uh, this year in the Grow Lab, I had the opportunity to observe these um, mineral sediments produced by cyanobacteria and the way they are bringing uh, the substrate. So I think the left one here is a uh, great proof of this process happening. And uh, we are looking at a scale of 50 micrometers, which is like slightly average, uh, half of average human cell size, very small. Um, finally, 
I identified the scientific uh, research needed to further develop this bifurcation process, such as enhanced biomineral precipitation, an alternative to the centrifuge, and also the possibility of exploring in the future um, the possibility if, if the bacteria could remain alive in the final uh, product. Um, thank you everyone for listening to me. And now I would like to hand over to my colleague, Habitat. Abigail, I think you're on mute still. Hi, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm from BA Textile Design. Um, I'm just having a bit of trouble going backwards on the slides. Sorry. Um, okay. Hi again. <laughs> So um, I'm from VA Textile Design. Um, my final collection explores creating closed loop compostable fabrics for the festival wear market. Um, so music festival style tends to celebrate fast fashion. Um, there's a social pressure to purchase a new outfit for the, for the event, usually something garish and not practical for everyday wear, um, which you throw away or it's just not, yeah. And it's made from cheap synthetic fibers and plastic beading or sequins that um, take thousands of years to degrade in landfill. Um, and I wanted to create a solution for this. So I began my research thinking about how I could use waste to create new materials and embellishments. Um, I collected household wastes that you'd usually put in the compost, things that are good for soil fertility, such as onion skins, avocado pits, wood ash, egg and mussel shrimp shells, coffee grounds, pet fur, were all used in my uh, material experiments. I tried loads of different bioplastic and natural resin um, recipes. I managed to create both hard and flimsy materials. I was, I was thinking about potentially developing these for beading, sequins, or even raincoats. Um, however, a lot of them did begin to mold despite me using natural preservatives in my recipes. Um, also aesthetically, they weren't really what I was going for. In the video, you can see some of my um, initial sequin experiments. It's been sped up for some reason. But <laughs> um, so I began thinking about how I could make embellishments shine that weren't made from microplastics because the Association of Independent Music Festivals in the UK um, announced its ban on single use plastics for 2021. Um, which includes glitter, a massive trend in festival fashion. Um, so I wanted to make glittery embellishments. I began experimenting with growing monoammonium phosphate crystals onto silk. Um, these non-toxic crystals contain nitrogen and phosphorus, essential nutrients for soil and plants. The concept being that my fabrics are worn and danced in at the festivals and the crystals would slowly fall off um, and provide the festival fields with nutrients to promote healthy soil growth for the next year as the soil is damaged as we dance on it, basically. Um, the crystals are relatively easy to grow. You just add the solution to water and let them sit for 12 hours or more, depending on how big you want your crystals. Um, so I experimented with different ways to control the crystal growth to see how I could design with it. Um, I grew them directly onto silk on a flat surface. I also suspended the silks in, into the water to try and see how they'd grow. I used ruching and moulds to grow them in certain shapes and added weights to prevent them from growing in different areas. Um, instead of using water, I experimented with using natural dyes from food waste to give the crystals some colour. I also um, found a way to make the crystals glow in the dark by growing them in tonic water rather than water because it contains a natural UV sensitive compound called quinine. I found that the crystals were relatively hard to control when growing them. So I was limited design wise. And as a print specialist, I, I wanted to create printed backgrounds before adding the crystal embellishments. Um, I pre-dyed all my silks with food waste, avocado pits, 
white and red onion skins, coffee grounds and red cabbage were my main sources. Um, I, then screen, I then created screen printed, screen print paste from the leftover dye baths. So there was no waste in my production process. Um, I screen printed the designs onto silks and then grew the crystals directly onto the prints or hand embroidered them on. Um, the idea being that the crystals would slowly fall off, revealing a print underneath, encouraging wear by sparking curiosity in the consumer. This lengthens the fabric's lifespan. Uh, my choice of silks and technique of hand embroidery also promotes the idea of luxury and slow fashion. Here are some images of my final collection. Low impact print and dye processes are used throughout my um, work and it minimizes waste and chemical use. They are 100% compostable and are embellished with an environmentally restorative solution. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I will hand over to... Actually, we're going to have a couple of questions now, I think, whilst it's kind of, whilst the projects are still fresh, fresh in our minds, really. Um, super interesting projects, uh, both of them. Um, and I think kind of, um, you know, I, Sinja, I loved how you introduced your, your project through an organism, um, as if your organism was kind of co-designing with you. Um, but I'm kind of curious as to how, how it really was working with, with scientists on your project. Yes. Um, well, at the beginning, I was extremely scared <laughs> uh, because I didn't really know what was the best way to approach someone with such a knowledge. And uh, but then uh, I realized how actually the, the scientific community is very, very interested in what we are all doing and in the in the in the arts and in the design. And uh, so we we established this relationship of uh, uh, teaching each other um, how, how we look at things and how we approach projects from different uh, perspectives. And I think this really uh, gave me a push and uh, made me even feel more confident in working with these uh, difficult topics uh, from which I don't have a background. Um, but uh, it, was, um, it was a great, a great uh, help. And it also made me um, focus on uh, smaller and more uh, practical aspects that otherwise I would not have uh, considered or um, such as measurable um, findings during the project. And uh, yeah, this was an incredible experiment and I am very grateful for their contribution to my project. Fantastic, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the idea of working with kind of invisible phenomena must be, you know, super challenging. Um, you know, Abby, you know, as somebody from a textile background, how do you feel that that kind of really helped move your project forward, perhaps in terms of the processes you used? Well, trying to go crystals, you can't really control them. <laughs> they kind of do what they want. Um, so trying to find ways to control them, I guess, was part of my design process. Um, yeah, it, I, it was difficult to integrate the both things like it yeah it was difficult I mean it, it seems like you did really well I mean some of the techniques you used um which you know obviously very definitely textile techniques like ruching and pleating did yeah. they kind of help the crystals in some way they definitely did like um the ruching side of things and what I found was they turn out different every time I do something <laughs> so that's where the hand embroidery kind of came in and bringing my my um, specialism as print specialist. I initially I wasn't actually going to do any printing on this project and wanted to just focus on on the crystals but it, I got to the point where nothing was going <laughs> the way I was planning to which happens in biomateriality it really does like I've worked with organisms before and it's not been easy that either so um, yeah you kind of just got to go with your crystal or organism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the range of textile skills you used was kind of great in, in, in combination with your with your organisms. Great, shall we move, keep going? And I think perhaps have Ronnie next. I think that would be great. Uh, I just saw that the next um, slide, it's say my name, but it's not my project. 
always ah okay but this is mine so yeah <laughs> So, hello, I'm Ronnie, and I'm not from MA Material Futures, and I'm from VI Jewelry Design, and I'm here with my project uh, Revealing. Um, but I can't scroll. Okay, I can. No, no. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, um, I discovered during my second year in the course that I enjoy um, working within sustainable um, borders and that I get satisfied from uh, recycling and applying trans transformative um, processes on waste products and revive them into new materials. And when I started uh, thinking about my project this year, I knew that it's gonna be uh, around materials. Sorry, I don't know why it's moving. Don't touch anything. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, I don't know okay. why it's happening. I don't touch anything. <laughs> Are you okay just to continue talking through it? Roughly running? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so I was interested um, in the idea of how people absorb objects uh, in general, how they look on, on things according to, to preset connotations they have on them and the way it's controlled, the, the way they value them. And it, it's a default psychological habit we all have and it's very natural and we can't control it. And I really wanted to explore this idea and kind of play with those, those rules and try to put under the spotlight unexpe unexpected objects or materials and the idea of having a tr transformation uh, on waste and make it look lux luxurious and relying on those connotations we have and questioning um, what is luxury to it and these two ideas um, intersect while I, I was in this year lockdown. Uh, I live alone and part of my daily routine was visiting at the grocers and I was looking on their onions and they have a lot of uh, onion skins in between them and they were really shiny and beautiful and they asked them what they do with all the leftovers and they told me that they every other day when they restock they threw them away and since that day i started to visit this shop every day and take like clear all the leftovers and collect the onions and i i research i, I tried to get some ideas of how we're going to use them and i researched about onions in general and i arrived to some metaphors about the onions layers and I looked on its own natural architecture, the way it's constructed from onions that create one whole together and the way the skin shield it from being rotten and exposed and it hides something inside it was very inspiring for me. And so I built my, my collection around kind of story of hidden truths and yeah, um, when I collect the skins, I firstly uh, organize them by shades and then I use scissors and I manually cut them and I had to create my own tools. Um, so I improvise with carving, wax carving tools 
And I managed to use the skins almost like micro thin wood. I inlay them um, under pressure and I, may, I, I, I managed to get durable and very lightweighted uh, material that was um, very um, accessible and I, while I test, while I test, uh, test them, uh, I realized that I can control the outer layer uh, with the natural colors and make patterns. Um, so yeah, um, my project is addressing recycling and upcycling, and I rely on the shop. Uh, stock so therefore every day I go there I came back with different shades and different uh, and different type of skins and it really controlled the, my, my design process and the way I built the collection um, I had to study how to use the material and sometimes I had like spontaneous accidents that also maneuvered the plan and I learned how to love them and the patterns sometimes hide things and it was very intuitive for me and um, yeah so sorry my collection has uh, nine pieces uh, the first pieces in my collection, um, they very manipulated with the material. I really try to hide it. A, it's a dead identity, um, create uh, different connotations with the own natural color of the skins. Um, so I, I, I thought of, of kind of referencing um, classic jewelry uh, styles or um patterns that commercial link uh, with fashion and therefore i made um leopard prints and checkers prints and later on gradually my collection symbolized every piece you move in the collection is is metaphorically but also uh, physically peeling back to the origin of the material when the the last pieces in my collection, they are mimicking, it's, it's sort of take on classic pearls, but the manipulation I put on the, on the material is very limited. I, it's, it's very plain and they look like pearls, but you can see hidden, hidden um, reference to the onion through them. And it's still progressing uh, because as I said, I really rely on the stock. So all the pearls are, are new for me because the shop got new, uh, the, the white onions in the end. So it's really born from the process. And yeah, I think that the process was very intense for me, good, intense and excited. And I spent many hours of inlaying a lot. It's very repetitive um, methodology. And I really broadened my music li uh, library, but I also really, really peeled my own layers and learned to, to enjoy myself in the process. And yeah, it was really special. <laughs> and this is where I am now, I guess. And I will move to Lars. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. Um, yeah, so my name is Lars, and uh, I'm a recent Material Futures graduate. And um, I'm very happy to uh, talk about my project, uh, Sculpting with Air, um, today. The Okay, I can't go to the next slide. Okay, 
Uh, no, I think now it's working. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the project is looking at airflow as a new tool to shape the growth of pure mycelium foam into particular shapes during the growth process of the material. Hmm. Yeah, something is off. Okay, second try. Um, so starting off, um, maybe a few words about mycelium in general. It is the root, uh, the root structure of fungi, and it loves to eat anything cellulose, and it secretes enzyme into the ground, or um, in the lab context, uh, we speak about substrate, to break down um, nutrients. And around this organism, a whole new industry of biomaterials has formed. In the left picture, you see how mycelium has formed um, uh, a biocomposite from agricultural waste, such as corn husk and hemp. And um, this material is um, quite close to styrofoam and is, it is actually already used um, in, in an industrial context. And um, starting off the project, I was interested in footwear pretty early on. And um, the picture on the right is kind of showing my early experimentation, uh, kind of making those um, uh, sneaker sculptures, incorporating the biocomposite and um, a sneaker um, waste, basically. Um, and within the, the biodesign um, world, there's a lot of conversation around co-designing with the living. And doing those very early um, experiments, I actually didn't feel like co-designing with the organism. It was just me kind of taking the material and putting it, it into a mold. And um, I think what kind of helped me to um, like, talk about what I mean is um, kind of talking about, talking about those two chairs. And the first one is a design um, by Eric van Klarenbeck and it's a PLA scaffold. It is designed by human in uh, 3D software. It is 3D printed and then filled with the mycelium and the mycelium kind of um, gives structural integrity but it's not really involved in the design process. Um, the chair only emulates the aesthetics of, of growth. Whereas in the picture on the right, um, the organism has a much greater involvement in the process and the human element or the involvement of the human is really just kind of um, learning about um, the natural forces that are involved in the growth process and um, really just nudging um, the organism into a desired shape rather than forcing it into um, a preconceived mold. So um, having done this early mycelium experimentation, I uh, dug a bit deeper and through conversations with two scientists from the Free University in Brussels, I learned about pure mycelium foam. And in theory, the process of growing the material is quite simple. Um, you take the substrate, basically what I did in the beginning, um, and you put it into a growth chamber that can create conditions of high humidity, high CO2, and temperatures around 30 degrees. And what, ha what happens is that the mycelium doesn't stay within the substrate. Um, on the right, you can see a picture um, of, um, the mycelium um, substrate in the plastic um, container. And um, through those uh, growing conditions, uh, the, my mycel the mycelium um, grows into a void space because it's kind of tricked um, thinking that it's still on the ground um, through, those con uh, through those conditions. Um, but really it forms this very thick um, mat of pure mycelium foam. And the quality of this foam can be quite um, um, different. You can get quite soft and uh, squishy um, foams, but also um, dense and firm uh, material characteristics. And one key element in growing this material is actually airflow. And um, through further research um, and my own experimentation, I found that airflow can be used to kind of structure the material as it grows. Um, on the left, you see one of the early experiments and uh, next to it, there's kind of a, um, a scheme that illustrates 
how the process roughly works. So you blow air from two sides and the air enter, uh, um, leaves the growth enclosure um, through the top. And that um, the mycelium kind of mimics this vortex that, that is created and that's reflected um, in the picture. And um, through this, throughout this whole process, um, I was also, um, or I was forced to kind of develop my own um, tools to kind of shape this um, material. And from, from those uh, lab experiments, uh, I derived my design proposal basically, which is a modular growth chamber that can um, create the desired um, growth environment. And um, it directs, or it, it uses directed airflow to shape the growth of the pure mycelium foam. And I also decided to um, just go with the shoe as an object because I think it's it's a quite nice um, discursive object because it talks about um, technology, but also aesthetics and um, and performance. And those um, those issues are quite um, um, important in the bio the biomaterial world at the moment. I think and. Um, I also um, just kind of by the nature of the process, I had to kind of think about how how to make the shoe um, to to fit basically. And what I did, I I, I designed a um, a shoe last that um, holds the substrate, but also has that perforation to allow the mycelium to um, kind of leave the shape um, of the foot and kind of like grow around it. And um, in the next video, you kind of get an idea of how the process roughly works. It's usually not as bumpy, but I think you get the idea. Okay, thank you. And I believe we have some time for questions now. Let me just go back one. Oh, spoiler, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, thank you so much, Lars. Really, both are both really, really interesting projects. I, lo I absolutely love the visuals and I think the process of that that project is is amazing. Um, one of the things that I'd sort of really like to to know, or we'd really like to know, is have you sort of any thoughts for the next stages of this project? Perhaps in terms of kind of mass mass market or sort of sort of upscaling, I guess. Um, yeah. Whether that is shoes or or other applications. Mm, so mm. the the material, the pure mycelium foam, is actually um, yeah. market ready. It's um. Yeah. I, I don't know, I, probably a lot of people heard about the pure um, the mycelium leather and this material is kind of the precursor of that my, mycelium leather. So yeah. the, pro the processes are in place. Um, what is more of a, I don't know, we're maybe talking like five years or 10 years because it actually needs much more um, experimentation yeah. um, when, when we talk about using the airflow to get a, like a really meaningful and um, uh, yeah, meaningful ap application that kind of um, also fulfills the needs for um, performance and uh, things like that to get like a, a repeatable um, outcome. Um, but I'm going to um, do a bit more experimentation over summer um, and just see where it goes really. Great. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's really good to know your going to carry on working with it because yeah it's really interesting um and then just back to you uh ronnie if you could just turn your microphone on a second um kind of i suppose in contrast your your project's so poetic um 
um, and sort of obviously very different sort of scale and, and quite precious. Have, have you any thoughts sort of how, how you imagine taking your project forward? Are you going to kind of carry, carry on as, as Lars is? Yeah, I'm, I'm planning to continue to develop it. I think towards the end, um, things started to really, really progress and I became much faster and much more productive. And I think that the fact that I'm not coming from a um, material-based course, so I had a bit less support in terms of better glues and better solution to test and my, my, lim my time was much more limited. So I, I find some, some sort of echo glue that work for me for this purpose and I learned how to use the material and how it reacts. And I think in this term, I have a lot of more options to, to progress. And also I realized that I can go really big. So it's, yeah. it's exciting. It's, it's, really, it's really fun. And I really enjoy to work with this also. So it's, it's quite fun, yeah. yeah. You, sound, you sound so passionate about, uh, about it. So uh, yeah, it's really interesting. To, it'd be interesting to see kind of where you, where you take it. Um, right, are we ready for ne next speakers? Luis, are you ready? Uh, yes, hi, <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, so, hey, uh, my name is Luis. Uh, I'm from MA by Design. Um, the title of my project is Fido Printing. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So, yeah, the title is Fido Printing, and the topic uh, I worked on is living materials. So, living materials are a composite material made of a living element that is integrated into a non-living component. And in this way, we can kind of uh, combine the two advantages of, of these two substances, the living and the non-living. And yeah, and this gives us a lot of new opportunities in sense of uh, biofabrication, uh, creating new structures, uh, um, or giving a material uh, extra functional feature. Uh, so examples here could be, for example, um, concrete that heals itself. Um, yeah, uh, the problem about that is uh, sometimes that you need one's specific knowledge to do living materials and also equipment. Um, so my, my target for my project was, uh, can I develop a process to create living materials on one hand, but also can I make it accessible to others, especially for designers, for makers, for, uh, for artists. Um, the organism I work with, or the group of organisms I work with is called uh, phytoplankton. That could be cyanobacteria, um, green algae, or in general, microalgae, diatoms, and they all do photosynthesis. So they use uh, sunlight to produce oxygen, to produce uh, energy, um, and they consume car uh, uh, calcium carbonate, uh, sorry, uh, uh, CO2, CO2, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the process. Um, what I did with these organisms, uh, I placed them on a surface with a little amount of water, and then I illuminated the surface with a uh, with a project uh, with a projector, and uh, depending on the light intensity, they, they started to grow like uh, because they need light, so they started to grow. Uh, that took around three to seven days, and then you get your living image. Um, and the cool thing about phyto printing in general is that you really can find them in all kind of colors from 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 yellow to pink, from green to blue, um, they appear in all, all um, environments on the world. So there's also like a huge color range. Um, yeah, some experiments I made. So uh, on the left side, this is a photo of the Bauhaus building uh, printed on ceramics. Uh, some ceramics was one of the materials that uh, worked really well. Uh, but I also tried to print on textiles, uh, in this case on, um, on silk and uh, with a cyanobacteria strain. Um, yeah, and I think the, the interesting part here is that at this point, the, the textile was more or less uh, alive. Uh, I said in the beginning that I also wanted to make this process accessible. Uh, so my target here was also to 
create a, create a tool, in this case, a, a FIDO printer. Um, it's a very simple setup with a, with a video projector on top and a container where you can place your material and where the whole uh, growth process take, takes uh, place. Um, I tried, tried to create a kind of uh, very simple plug system that you uh, can remove the container, place your own setup um, uh, that you can, yeah, that it is more adaptable to different people that work in different uh, environments. Um, and of course, I try to kind of create a, a bigger picture what you may will do with it in the future. So could it be, for example, uh, interior um, textiles that are alive, that you have in your room, that breathe, that metabolize, that clean the air? Or maybe you want to focus more on the kind of user experience of living garments, how, how, how our use change uh, in the sense of, OK, I can't, can't throw it in the washing machine anymore because it's alive. Uh, but uh, how, how how do I take care of it, and how how does the, the yeah how does that change? Um, yeah, so yeah, the idea the whole idea of the project was really to develop the process, and on one hand, and also uh, make it accessible to to others. So yeah, that's that was Fido printing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do you do you want to pass it on, Nicoletta? Hi, hello. Um, so uh, I think I can share also my presentation. So it seems that it doesn't. Yeah, it works. Great. Uh, so my name is Nicole, and I'm a designer maker from Greece, currently based in London. Um, recently graduated from MA Material Futures. So today I'm going to present you my final major project, Bactera. Uh, Bactera, it's a, a project that explores the use of biotechnology within pottery. Uh, so I'm proposing uh, a process which is called biomineralization. And uh, with uh, bacteria uh, and ceramic waste as my main ingredients, I'm creating ceramics that they are self-fired uh, and they are um, biologically glazed by the bacteria in the process. So uh, I'm going to briefly say you some things about how this project started. So it started last, last March uh, during COVID, where I found myself in isolation as all of us. So I had a lot of time to rethink my process as a designer and as a ceramicist. And also I had the time to unpick every aspect of my beloved craft, that of uh, pottery. So I identified quite um, a lot of problematic areas. Uh, people think that ceramics, it's a harmless escape from the stress of contemporary life. But one of the problematic areas, it's uh, the energy consuming and uh, carbon heavy um, kiln firings. So at that point, having no access to workshops and having all these things in mind, I thought that it would be so interesting if I could create ceramics that they don't require firing at all. So I started uh, making some recipes, bio recipes. The result was, were, were like nice samples, but the problem was that they were not waterproof. So I thought that maybe there is another um, process, there is another recipe, something that I could use. So I researched and I found about bimineralization. Uh, it's a process that uh, scientists are researching the last 10 years, mainly geologists for soil reinforcement, for self-healing concrete or bio bricks. So this process is a process by which living organisms produce living, uh, produce minerals, sorry, to harden existing tissues. So what happens like the bacteria are pumped to the aggregate and establish themselves between the grain particles. And when calcium chloride is added, uh, the bacteria produce calcite, which is a sticky st substance, let's say, that uh, glues the grains together. So I thought that that would be really interesting if I could somehow combine this technology, because it's a really promising technology, with a traditional craft, kind of creating a hybrid. Um, 
So I used uh, ceramic waste as my aggregate from broken ceramic pieces. I grind the ceramic pieces into a powder like rock. And then I cultivate the bacteria. It's a soy-born bacteria, which is called Sporcyrkina vasculi. It's also non-pathogenic, which made it easier for me to work with it. And then I put the grog, the powder, in, in a mold. And I um, add the bacteria solution and the cementation solution, which is, as I told you before, an ingredient such as calcium chloride. And the mold stays inside the water tank. Uh, for around three to seven days, where it starts to solidify by this process. An indication of this process is all, most of the time a strong smell of ammonia, which is an indication that the bacteria are happy and they are doing their, their work. Uh, so after three to seven days, I take my pieces out of the water tank and I dehydrate them. And as you can see, these are the three vessels that I've managed to create with this process. They're not perfect. They have some imperfections, some holes, some bumps, you, like the texture, it's kind of, yeah, uh, shows this natural process. And I think in general, it's a process that we should explore more, maybe uh, use different aggregates, use different waste. And I really want to continue doing that and see what are the possibilities and other design applications. Uh, so thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, both of you. Such such great projects. Um, yeah, I mean, I think three to seven days seems to be the magic number. Actually, <laughs> I kind of imagine that both processes would be an awful lot slower, but you know, three to seven days seems seems relatively quick. So you know, perhaps both of you would like to kind of think about what perhaps the challenges might be of working with these organisms. Maybe maybe Lewis, you go first. What kind of yeah. uh, technical or, or kind of yeah challenges of working with the, the living organisms um so yeah like it's all about creating the perfect environment for for the organism that he is going to do what what you want to do him uh so and there are a lot of a lot of th things that you have to think about like the ph level the uh, temperature the uh the light conditions and of course, like bacteria and algae can't speak, so they can't tell you what's wrong. And it takes just a lot of time to figure out where, where the problems are, where, what, what went wrong. And um, that's, of course, kind of time consuming. But um, but yeah, in the end, if you get them where they are, like they're, they're three to seven days seems to be long, but, but in the end, it isn't because, for example, there are um, uh, algae strains that double every six hours and I don't know any any the same with bacteria I don't know any other organisms that, that double so fast if we think about I don't know wood or, or uh, other materials that we find in nature yeah great thank you thank you and, and Nicole perhaps from your perspective you know how does time you know have have a, a, a part to play because obviously ceramics have got a huge connection with time and the past you know how does time connect with your project and the challenges of working with the organisms um, i think this project was nice that it began in this period of covid 19 because it also shows that uh, we should somehow reflect on the way that we live this fast-paced world that we live and uh, working with these uh, living organisms i had really to observe them learn how what they like it's like honestly they have a a collaborator with me so I had to be patient with them learn their behavior and I honestly enjoyed this thing even though we as as many of us uh, had a lot of challenges to overcome it was nice because it's a new process it's a natural process and and you can really use it to do great things so I think being patient it's one of the the, the lessons that I've learned during this right this process. Yeah. Seems like you both made great friends of your organisms anyway. Yeah. So that's that's got some our baby sometimes. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Great. So um I don't know what that brings us to are there any questions? Um, yeah, I can I can take over, um, Rebecca. We've thank got you. one or two more questions that we can answer in our time frame. Um and thanks for, to everybody who's presented. Really exciting to see all your projects together in in a kind of in a context that is 
yeah, across the program. We've got a really good question from Heather Barnett and she's asking all presenters, having worked creatively with living systems and biomaterials, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start working in this way? What advice would you give yourself at the start of your project? <laughs> Hi, uh, I don't know, maybe I can probably answer from my point of view. I think that uh, really important for all of those projects was to have uh, scientists like collaborators, because obviously all of us, we are designers, so we don't really know exactly all the technical stuff about how organisms work. So it was, I think for me, it was really essential that we had scientists that we could talk with them and um, make questions about how we could develop the project. So uh, the advice would be, if you have an idea of what you want to do, it would be really nice early on to start looking for people who can help you with this project. And you will be impressed of how people, like people are really positive and they really want to help. So just send some emails and get your experts with you. Yes, I, I agree totally with uh, Nicole, and um, I would also like to say maybe to the also not not be too scared of jumping into these uh, projects or in this field. It seems uh, huge; it might seem overwhelming, but uh, it's it's fine. It's fun, and uh, so yes, I would say if you want to do it, do it, and it will be fun. Um, do a lot of research, but. Um, don't be scared. And there's plenty of uh, yeah, scientists and also us and others, uh, other designers trying to get into this field. I think, yeah, like Nicole said, it's great to reach out. And in this way, you also don't feel alone in trying to do these things. Have we any more questions, Anne? Yeah, that is, um, I think there was one question from Sabrina Hassan, and it's a bit more of a philosophical question, um, and it is, what have the social, political or cultural changes you have noticed from your projects been now in post-production, such as any influ influ influences, discussions or otherwise? So what have been the social, political or cultural changes you have noticed from your projects? I can maybe try and answer uh, one aspect of this. So um, I started looking into my CM actually um, also just because during lockdown, there was nothing really accessible. And I was thinking a lot about supply chains and how crazy it actually is, how the production system um, we're operating, yeah, how, how, how fragile it is. And how crazy and how um, reliant um, we are in making those things and like things from all over the world come together in one object and by kind of um, tapping into um, the resources that are around you and um, bringing in those organisms to help transform those raw materials which are most of the time waste actually like mycelium uses agricultural residues um, and kind of finding new streams um, to make something. Um, I think that's what I learned throughout um, this project. And um, yeah. Thank you, Lars. I think we will have to come to a close now because we're already a little bit over time. Um, is there anything from Hannah or from Rebecca that you would like to add? Um, I th yeah, I think if we're up, up, um, up on time, then I think we've, we've, we've covered an awful lot <laughs> today. So, but yeah, that's everything from me. Do you, do you There's want to ask more. A, wider, a wider question, Hannah? You know? Yeah, if, if we've got time to ask something. I, th I think we've got time, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, something we've really been kind of talking about um, mix recently is just kind of how new or any designer or you know particularly you guys must feel quite a kind of weight or sort of 
level of responsibility kind of for, for the future and clearly you guys do because of the sorts of projects you've, you've worked on can any of you kind of say you know how has this driven or what, what was what, was that the starting point for your for your projects um and how do you think this kind of might drive you now you've sort of finished um at university how do you think that might drive you kind of further and uh, and beyond um with, with a sense of kind of biomateriality <clears throat> is there anyone that um has any thoughts on that It's a big question that. It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it could just be, yes, I do. <laughs> maybe, maybe in terms of d democratizing the technology. I mean, that's, I yeah, think, yeah. Is kind of interesting and making it accessible to, to other people or sharing knowledge. Do yeah. you, maybe you have any ideas kind of about how that, how you might kind of go about that? Yeah, or sort of op open sourcing your, your sort of findings or kind of sharing them with with people who are doing similar things perhaps um seems to be the way things are going um with kind of material technologies for sure maybe lewis would you like to kind of just touch on that a little yeah. bit uh yeah I, I totally agree so um is, well, my, my microphone is on right yeah. yes yeah we can uh, okay <laughs> uh i totally agree like i i, I developed these uh process and i don't know like there, there were people before that worked in this direction, uh, but nobody shared their 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 process. Like I understand that on one on one side, but on the other hand, like I decided for myself that I don't want to hide it or something like that. I I think it should be accessible for all, for all of us, and it's about creating like uh, new ways how we produce. And uh, yeah, that would be great if if people um are going to 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 explore this this process so yeah, yeah. totally agree yeah thank you sincere dare i ask if 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 you've got you know what your sort of thoughts are for kind of taking the project forward and and perhaps kind of um looking for kind of scaling scaling that up a little bit or sort of sharing some ideas hmm. oh you're still on mute Sorry, that was a question for me. Oh, no, for, for um, um, Cynthia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, kind of perhaps the future of uh, yes. your project. So um, I'm looking into that. Actually, the first thing that I'm that I'm doing now is uh, getting back in contact with this uh, um, lab in Boulder who who made uh, the first research in the first place. And now uh, I would like to, uh, them, if if they're happy to, uh, to check uh, my process to see what they think about it, and uh, and then take it um, take it from there and see where this can uh, where this can go on. But definitely, I agree. With Louis, I I would be very happy if this is uh, I will keep it open open source and it will make me extremely happy to see if someone gets inspired by my project and decides to try something also different but from from this. So I think that one sort of responsibility that I feel in in uh, in, in my role is uh, um, I I would like to communicate something positive and I I would like someone to catch on from that and then that's the sharing knowledge that I would like to be doing with my work. Great, it all sounds really positive. <laughs> Anyone else or should we? Should I think, I think, and does anybody have any fine, final input or maybe Anne would like to do a little sum up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just, just a big thank you to everybody. Um, to all the panelists and the students presenting. And I think we can't underestimate how amazingly you have done um, in, a, in a time of, of global pandemic. We probably didn't emphasize that enough at the beginning. And I'm just still in awe how you managed to not only um, discover really new, exciting biomateriality and, and solutions for, for really big problems and issues that we're currently facing, but also, yeah, to show the resilience to continue to, to study and to, to produce really positive and future looking outcomes. So a big congratulations and um, big thanks to our attendees for all the questions. There's more in the chat if, if um, panelists want to have a look um, and, and read all the positive comments. 
thank you all for coming. And of course, last but not least, Hannah, The Hive, and also Rebecca, thank you very much for yeah, being here, um, kind of creating the visibility, be being um, really um, great collaborators um, and partners, uh, industry partners um, and communicators of what our students do. We really appreciate your support, your interest, and we we'll look forward to the publication of your next, um, the printed publication of your next, um, uh, yeah, kind of mixed magazine, which I believe some of the projects will be featured in. So Indeed. thank and you so much. End of August. <laughs> Great, so watch, watch out for that. <laughs> um, yeah, we're really, really happy um, to have you all here and we'll hope you have a good summer. We would love to continue to talk, but we'll only have this kind of fairly short uh, time frame. So if you want to dig deeper into the project, there is much more about the process and the, the details on our graduate showcase if you want to find out more. So yeah, once again, a big thanks. And um, I think we can yeah close the session and yeah, hopefully see you all online for something else. <laughs>